Thanks. Actually, it was on the schedule originally, but somebody else was going to give it. So you know, and yeah. But uh, so I thought it might be easier if I gave it. So that'd be yeah. Okay. Um, yeah, so the, the background of this is that uh, in oceanography, an, an important topic is, is we, we have all these satellites, right? We have all these satellites which are observing the surface of the ocean. So you have surface altimetry, which is the topography of the surface. You have surface temperature. You have now surface salinity um, and chlorophyll. So we have all these different measurements of that. Uh, I mean, it's revolutionized oceanography because before that you had to take a ship and you, it took a month to take a short little jog across a region like this, and you got a sort of a slice of what the ocean was doing at that location at a time. Now we have these synoptic surveys of the whole ocean surface, so remarkably different. Um, but the question, it is only the surface, and so one thing that we're interested in knowing is what is it that surface information tell us about what's happening below the surface? Okay. There was a fundamental study on this back in 1997, so a little over 20 years ago, uh, by Carl Wunsch, where uh, he took a number of current meter moorings, uh, pr primarily in the northern hemisphere, and he looked at structures from using those current meters to try and understand what the vertical structures looked like. Okay. Um, and what he did primarily was he projected these on baroclinic modes. So baroclinic modes are, a, again, another central concept in oceanography, and it's a, it's a Fourier, it's basically a, uh, a Fourier series that we use for describing the vertical structure. So the, the vertical structure is, comes about from an equation which looks like this, uh, with a boundary condition at the top and a boundary condition at the bottom, and it gives you a sturm liouville problem, so you have a set of eigenvalues and eigenvectors, and those eigenvectors are what we use to describe the structure. Uh, and typically it's done like this. You make a flat surface for the upper part of the ocean, so you ignore surface waves. Um, and you make a flat lower surface, okay? So we ignore bottom topography. So we just make those two assumptions. Uh, and when you do this, uh, you can get uh, these type of structures. So this is what happens if n, n here is the, is the stratification parameter, okay, the buoyancy frequency, um, and you get these. If n is constant, then you can see you're just going to get, this is constant, then you're just going to have sinusoidal solutions, and the ones that that obey the surface boundary condition, which is a Neumann condition, um, are cosine functions, right? So you have cosine functions, and the vertical gradient vanishes at the top and the bottom. So there's one mode which has no variation with depth. That's the barotropic mode, okay? And that another is another centerpiece of oceanography is the barotropic. We have lots of barotropic models, um, depth average models, like, uh, like the shallow water model. Um, and then these are the higher, these are the baroclinic modes. The first one crosses zero once and goes to, has an opposite sign at the bottom. That's called the first baroclinic mode. Uh, and then we have these higher modes, the second baroclinic mode, the third baroclinic mode. Uh, it's an orthogonal it's a set, it's a complete set. So any vertical structure that you have, as long as it's smooth, can be described by a superposition of those uh, uh, modes. Now when you have more realistic stratification, for example, exponential stratification, I'll show you an example of why that's more realistic. You still have the sparotropic mode because the barotropic mode satisfies those boundary conditions. It vanishes at the top and the bottom. Um, it's automatically a solution to this equation because d phi dz vanishes everywhere here. Um, and phi is a constant, so c then is just uh, a constant here. And that, so that barotropic mode always exists regardless of what type of stratification you have. But the other modes, the baroclinic modes change and they become more surface intensified. So here's this first baroclinic mode. This crosses zero here, about this depth, and it comes down. You have smaller amplitudes at the bottom, okay? But non-zero amplitudes also at the bottom. But so there's a large amplitude here, a weaker one. So everything is shifting up, okay? But basically, it looks like this, just sort of projected upward in the water column. Okay, so what Wunsch did was he took the current meter observations and he projected them onto those modes. All right, so here's, the, here's an example. This is one current meter. This is a very good current meter because this had one, two, three, four, five, six, seven different instruments in the vertical. That's almost unheard of, but, um, but it's uh, one of the better examples. And he projected those velocities onto the first barotrop on the barotropic mode, and here's the first baroclinic mode, and so forth. And what he found, and this was a big deal when this came out, what he found was that 90% of the variance 
could be captured with just two modes alone. So this barotropic mode and this first baroclinic mode. Okay, those two things were all you needed. So this was really nice because this meant that if you were looking at the surface of the ocean, you could, uh, you were basically looking at only two modes, not 50 modes, but two. Uh, and what he claimed also is that because the amplitude of this first baroclinic mode was larger at the surface, then when you're looking at altimeter data in particular, what you're primarily looking at is that, okay, that first baroclinic mode. Uh, and he, and I, I was a student when he wrote this paper, so I remember that he was very worried about what do you do about that barotropic mode? How do we find out what that barotropic mode is? The barotropic mode tends to be very fast. Uh, it's not resolved by the satellites. Uh, so how do you pick that up? Uh, so that was the question. Okay, there was another interesting thing, though, in that paper, and he calculated EOF. So these are empirical orthogonal functions. So in, rather than specifying what the what the set of, of basis functions are, you let the data decide this. So you do a, you do a singular value decomposition with the data, and then you pull up what the, what the dominant structures are. The dominant structure for this, this current meter looked like this. It was largest near the surface, and then it decayed monotonically with depth, going down towards zero. Okay. Now in the paper, what he said was, well, this is most likely a combination of the barotropic mode and the first part clinic mode. So basically, the EOF was making an error that it was mixing these two modes. Okay. Not well, it combined. Okay, hold on to that. Um, I don't think so, but yeah, but it's but you're okay because what it's what you would, for that to happen, what you would need is the barotropic and the first bar clinic mode would somehow have to be cooperating to bring this to zero. Uh, and you, so you have a sort of a fundamental problem that you have a fast mode and a slow mode which are somehow coupled with each other. Okay. So, and he said, you know, they have to be coupled, but how, didn't know. Okay. We went back and we looked at this problem. So, this was a couple of years ago. I had a postdoc working with me, and we got a hold of a bunch of current meter data from a, a large, larger database, which was uh, available in France. Uh, and we put on a couple of stipulations about what the data would look like. So, it had a certain number of instruments and blah, blah, blah. And we came up with 69 different moorings spread all over the place. So North Atlantic, North Pacific, in the equatorial Indian Ocean, Southern Ocean, South Atlantic. All right. And what we did is we focused on these EOFs, okay, these EOFs, which... Um, and this is, for, this is an example from the North Atlantic. So this is from a current meter in the North Atlantic. And this is the EOF this, with the dots. So the dots are every, where you have an observation. So one, two, three... Uh, four or five, I think. Uh, and so this is not as many instruments as that other one, but this is more typical of what you find. And the dominant EOF, which captures 83% of the variance, so most of the variance at this signal is captured by this structure, and it's the same thing. It's largest near the surface, and it decreases to something close to zero down at the bottom. Okay, so it basically means the currents are doing this. They're flopping back and forth with a larger amplitude at the surface and nothing down at the bottom. Okay. Now, if you were to interpret this as the first baroclinic mode following Munch, this is the first baroclinic mode, this blue curve, uh, and we set the amplitude to be the same at that top instrument, and it crosses zero, and it comes down and has a different value at the bottom. Okay, so we would have to add a barotropic, some sort of barotropic component here to cancel that flow if we were going to explain this structure. Okay, but there's another curve here. There's actually two other curves, but you can ignore the green one. The red curve here which goes right through those points, okay? So there's another structure which does that. Now, what is that? So that is, if you go back to the baroclinic mode problem, okay, so we have the same equation here, uh, and instead of, so we use the same surface boundary condition, we ignore surface waves. Surface waves are typically one meter high on an ocean which is 5,000 meters deep, okay? So assume, neglecting those turns out not to be much of a problem. Um, but down here, we change the boundary condition. So instead of having no vertical motion, we don't make it flat. We assume we have some sort of rough boundary. Uh, and then we assume that the horizontal velocity is vanished instead. Okay. So the bottom topography, we don't know what it is, but it's, supposed, it's large enough and rough enough that it's bringing, somehow causes the bottom velocities to be zero. All right, when you do this, so this is an example of the calculation with an exponential uh, stratification. Uh, when you have a flat bottom, it looks like, yes, there's the barotropic mode, 
there's the first baric clinic mode, second baric clinic mode. When you switch to this rough bottom condition, um, two things happen. The baric clinic modes, instead of going, having a non-zero value at the bottom, they have zero value, okay, because they have no flow. So this is the first baric clinic mode. It just decreases from the surface and goes to zero. Second baric clinic mode crosses zero and then goes down, and then the third and so forth. So all those, yes? Right. So Alan O'Neill in Color Nine yeah. uh -huh. uh -huh. uh -huh. trying to figure out a boundary condition of the appropriate for the base of the stratosphere. Uh-huh. Uh-huh. Okay, so the tropopause, basically. Ah. Uh -huh. Okay. Okay. Okay, I would be interested in that, yeah. I mean, I've given this talk, also I gave this talk, when, uh, or version, parts of this at Woods Hole, and someone came up to me afterwards and said, Nick Fafanoff, so we mentioned, uh, someone mentioned this yesterday, the Fafanoff solution, right? Um, Nick Fafanoff had talked about baroclinic modes back in the 50s, oh, you did, yeah, about back in the 1950s. And, uh, and he said that the um, baroclinic modes are the ones that go to zero at the bottom. Okay, so observationalists are not surprised by this at all because this is what they see, right? And so this is what they would describe as the shear. And then he said, um, the barotropic mode is the one that accounts for the bottom velocities, okay? Um, which is not quite correct, so, but I'll come back to that too. Mm. Just to clarify, yep. your phi is actually a gradient of the pressure, right? The, the phi... It's, the phi is, related, is directly proportional to the pressure. So, so the horizontal velocities are the lateral gradients of that function. So this is, this is basically so what the, the horizontal velocity is. That comes back when you, have, when you actually have a bottom slope. And I'll come to that too, because I'll talk about where, where that happens. But in this case, it's just a pure Dirichlet boundary condition, just vanishing. Yeah. Okay. Um, the other point here is that when you do this bottom boundary condition, it kills off the barotropic mode, right? Because the barotropic mode has no flow, has flow at the bottom, so that is necessarily removed from this. So we don't have a barotropic mode anymore. Okay. Um, it's this, so this is what I call surface modes. This is the, this baroclinic mode that has this rough bottom condition. And the first surface mode is this red curve here, calculated with the actual stratification. And you see it's right on top of this, this EOF. Okay, so this EOF looks very much like the first surface mode. Um, and you can do this in other locations as well. This is in the Kuroshio in the North Pacific. Here's in the North Atlantic, South Atlantic, Canary Current, Antarctic Circumpolar Current, and the Gulf Stream. And in all cases, the red curve here which is the first surface mode, falls right on top of this dominant EOF, and in all of these cases accounts for more than 80% of the variance. Okay. So this suggests that, that this first surface mode is probably relevant for, for the ocean. All right. And now we don't need a barotropic mode. We don't have to combine it with anything. This is the beautiful part of this, is that you have one single mode now. So instead of saying we have two modes when you're using a satellite information, we have two modes, and we don't know what one of them is. Now we say we have one mode, and that's what it is. Okay, so it's related. To this. So this is very useful when it comes to interpreting satellite data. Okay, so I wrote a paper a couple of years ago trying to understand how this would happen. How much of a slope, for example, would you need, a bottom slope would you need to switch off the bottom velocities? So you solve the same problem. Um, no vertical velocity at the top, but then you have a more complicated bottom condition, which is closer to a Robin condition down at the bottom, because you have a slope, all right? Uh, and it just means that the normal velocities now are vanishing, but the normal velocities are no longer vertical, they're tilted because of the slope, all right? Um, now the constant stratification case, which just is, the equation was this, so this is the sines and cosines. This was done back by Peter Rines in a paper in 1970. So in this paper is usually referred to because it's one of the first papers to look at topographic waves, topographic Rossby waves. Um, but he also derives these baroclinic modes uh, with this constant stratification. Now the surface, the, the solution which obeys the surface condition is just this cosine function. 
And if, again, if we had phi equals zero at the bottom, we would retain a cosine function, but then these would become uh, quantized. So we'd get a set of uh, discrete eigenvalues here for the vertical structure. Um, when you apply the bound and boundary condition, though, if you have this, because you have a tilt, then you end up with a transcendental equation, which looks like this. Um, this is nonlinear, uh, and so you end up solving this uh, numerically to, to get the solutions. And the solutions look like this. So I'll show you the first Barrett clinic mode. Um, this is with a slope of 10 to the minus 6, so a very weak slope, a micro slope. Um, and you see that it starts at 1 and it goes to minus 1. This is what you would also get if you have a flat bottom. So when you're down to a slope of 10 to the minus 6, you have a slope, you have a Barrett clinic mode which looks like what you would get with a flat bottom. But as you increase the slope, this is 10 to the minus 5, this is 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 3, then the bottom velocities get weaker and weaker. So as the slope gets stronger, then you're shutting off the bottom flow. And the answer in this case is that you need a bottom slope of about 10 to the minus 3 to shut off the bottom slopes. Okay. Um, that's not tiny. That's a one milli slope. Okay. But it's not zero either. So it's not negligible. Um, uh, 10 to the minus, uh, typically in the ocean, when you're near the edges, the continental slope, you're talking about slopes of 1 or 2%. So this is about one-tenth of that. But still, there are regions in the ocean where you have flatter conditions than this. Okay. Now, what I did, though, is I redid the problem with exponential stratification. Exponential stratification is more realistic in the ocean. So this is a plot of the density at one, one of those current meters that we looked at um, in the red dots. And then the black curve here is, a, is an exponential fit. And you see it's very close to exponential. You find this in a lot of places uh, in the ocean. Um, it hasn't actually ever been properly explained, I think, why stratification is exponential, but it often is exponential. Um, and so we solve this problem now with this. Uh, you plug this into this, and you get a Bessel's equation. Okay, so you end up with Bessel functions. The solution to this, which satisfies the surface boundary condition, looks like this. Um, and then you have a bottom boundary condition, which was too long to fit onto this uh, slide, so I left it out. But it, there is a transcendental equation, and then you find these discrete values of these, these eigenvalues. Okay. Bessel, yeah, the Bessel, that's a, that's a Bessel function there. These are all Bessel functions, yeah. Um, up here, this is the Bessel, yeah, yeah. But what you learned is not n squared. This is not n squared, this is, that's correct, that's the density. So if you take the derivative of this, um, you tend to have a noisier distribution. Um, but the, the nice thing is, is that when you, when you say it's exponential, the density and the stratification both are exponential. So what we tend to do is we tend to fit the density, because it's a smoother function, fit that with, the density, with an exponential, rather than n squared, which is noisy. Yeah. Um, and this is what it looks like when you do this. And so this is a typical value of the stratification at the surface, so something which is realistic. And these are the slopes. So 10 to the minus 7 now, so one-tenth of a microslope, uh, has a larger amplitude here, and it goes down to an opposite sign at the bottom. And that's the flat bottom limit. This is 10 to the minus 6 brings you here, and 10 to the minus 5 is basically enough to switch off the bottom velocity. So 10 to the minus 5 is a tiny slope, okay? This is, this is a 100-kilometer wave, by the way. Um, I can say a word about that in a second, but that's a typical size for an eddy in the ocean. If you look at satellite data, you, you have these things which are about 100 kilometers. So 10 to the minus 5 is a really small slope, uh, and that means that with this realistic stratification, you're more sensitive to what ha is happening at the bottom. What happens with exponential stratification is that you have very weak stratification down here, so effectively the bottom is being felt over a larger portion of the water column. Okay, um, so this is what the bottom slopes look like in the ocean. Um, this is calculated from, this is from a one-tenth of a degree data set, but then we smooth it to one degree. And we're taking differences at basically at 100 kilometers. So we're assuming this is what a 100 kilometer eddy would see. And these are the slopes. And you see that the smallest slopes here are 10 to the minus 4. All right. And so this whole region, which we tend to think of as fairly flat, these are the abyssal plains in the Pacific, um, in fact, are not flat. Right. So you have, you have all this variation, which is, again, with slopes on the order of 10 to the minus 4. Um, as you get further west, there tends to, there's more tectonic uh, activity and you have larger uh, slopes. So here, 10 to the minus 3, 10 to the minus 2, whatever. But the point is it's very hard to find large regions of the oceans with slopes less than 10 to the minus 4. Okay, you can, if you look hard, you can find little spots, but not much. So if you have eddies 
which are propagating across, which I'll show in a second as well, um, they're experiencing slopes which are definitely at least 10 to the minus 4. And so again, this is, so I concluded, that, okay, this is what the current meters, because the current meters showed basically the same thing in every location, that you always have this kind of uh, EOF, this dominant EOF, and this would explain why, because the topography is, is large enough, um, even though it's not very large, uh, it's large enough to shut off the bottom flow. Okay, so now there's an interesting, one of the, there's several interesting implications for this, and one of those has to do with, with eddies. This is a snapshot of sea surface height, and again, this is, I mean, these are wonderful, you can get these uh, films online. Uh, this is from NASA, uh, and this is, so this is a sea surface height anomaly. They've taken away the mean component, uh, and uh, this is, this was, used to be a, a, uh, a loop here, but it's not running, but that's okay. Oh, it's a PDF, that's why. Um, but anyway, uh, when you do this, you can see that you have this westward propagation of these structures. This is a ubiquitous feature of these eddies, that when you look in the ocean, these things are propagating westward. And over here, these are propagating westward. This large structures here are propagating rapidly westward. These are uh, Rossby waves, okay, in the ocean. These are, they're propagating like Rossby waves. I mean, they're nonlinear, but they behave like Rossby waves. The only exception is when you're down here in the Antarctic Circumpolar Current, and these are actually moving eastwards, but that is because you have a very large current, which wraps, we talk, heard about this yesterday too, the largest current in the world, the a ACC, which wraps all the way around, and when you superimpose that eastward flow on the westward propagation, then the eddies tend to go east, but everywhere else they're going west. All right. Um, when you look at characteristics of these eddies, um, the eddies, this is the eddy size, and this is the eddy propagation speed. What they, the, prop, the eddy size correlates very well with the deformation radius, and the deformation radius is, is basically the first eigenvalue from the Baraclinic problem, okay? So this is the first, um, the first eigenvalue from the flat bottom Baraclinic thing. This was a paper back in 97, looking at this. Uh, and there was a famous paper, and I'll talk this, about this one. This is um, 1996, where they looked at the speed of these westward propagating features, and they found that they agreed fairly well with Rossby wave theory um, given a flat bottom ocean, okay, with some exceptions, which I'll mention here in a second. But basically, the eddy speed goes like this, you expect it to go like the square of the deformation radius, the square of this eigenvalue. All right. Now, as I said, the deformation radius is the, it's the horizontal scale that's associated with the first baroclinic mode. And when you do this with a rough bottom, you get a larger value than you do with a flat bottom. Okay, so the deformation radius increases when you have a flat bottom. All right. So what we did was we, this is, I did some work with a postdoc down in Australia. I was in Australia last year. And we calculated the deformation radius over the globe. Uh, using data from all over the place, so um, density data from all over the place. So these are the um, these are some examples. This is the flat bottom case. Uh, this is the observed vertical mode. Let's see, I forget which we have here. Oh yeah, this is the flat bottom, and then this one over here is the rough bottom. Uh, the rough bottom you see goes to zero like this, and this flat bottom crosses. This is first bar clamp mode crosses zero here. Okay. Um, when we calculate the deformation radius as a function of latitude with a flat bottom, it looks like this, okay? So it increases, increases. It gets up to the largest values are at the equator. At the equator, we shift over to a different approximation, so, but generally, we, you can ignore the equator. Um, it's really outside of this range, which is about five south to five north. Um, and up here, it decreases again, going to high latitudes. And this is a well-known fact as well. When you're up at high latitudes, like where I live, up in Oslo, okay, the deformation radius is very small. So typically on the order of five kilometers. So it's a very small number. When you use a rough bottom, though, then these estimates get larger. Okay, and you can see the difference between these two. Not entirely different, but, but larger. All right. So when you map these things, this is what the, the flat bottom deformation radius looks like. And this, is, this was, um, there was a paper by Chelton also. He was the one who looked at the speeds. And he published a map of this. And this is a very typical thing that oceanographers look at. And they say, OK, here, for example, in the North Atlantic, there's a 30 kilometer curve. My eddy should be about 30 kilometers large. Okay? And what Stommer used in this comparison here is essentially 
data from this map, okay, this map of how large the deformation ray is. Now, if you go to the first surface rays, so you're at the same latitude, then you look over here at this curve, and then what you see is that, no, actually, the deformation rays is more like 40 kilometers, not 30 kilometers. So it's, it's somewhat bigger, typically um, by some factor, okay? And if you take the ratio of these two things, so this is the ratio of the surface deformation radius to the flat bottom deformation, you get this kind of figure here. Um, this is one, so the values are at least one, and then they increase all the way up to two. So when you have regions where you have two, this means that the, def the, flat the rough bottom deformation radius is 100% larger than it would be there. And that's typically at the high latitudes, up in these regions here. So instead of having, a, say, a five kilometer deformation radius, you might have a 10 kilometer deformation radius. But elsewhere, this is a curve, this is zonally averaging here. What you tend to see is that it's the increase is by 25 to 50%. Okay. So it's not entirely different, but 50% is not small either. So it's a significant change in the deformation rates. Now this has some implications. For one, it has an implication about how fast the eddies travel, because the travel speed goes like the square of the deformation radius. All right. So back in this paper, this is this Chelton and Schlack's paper in 1996, they compared the observed propagation speeds with that's what would be expected for Rossby waves with this deformation radius. And what they found is that, I mean, it looks pretty good. Often I, I use this figure when I'm teaching um, beginning master students, and I say, see how good our theory is? Isn't that nice? You know, our nice, simple theory. But if you look here on the wings, you know, it's, it's not so good, right? And if you take the ratio of this to that, then you get a factor of two um, in the mid to higher latitudes. So a pretty substantial difference between this and that. And this paper had a huge impact, okay? A lot of theoretical, theoretically inclined people in oceanography suddenly th thought this was fascinating, and there were a bunch of papers that came out explaining why you should have a factor of two. Okay, there were a number of things. Um, okay, now the point is though, if you just switch modes, okay, you just switch from the flat bottom baric clinic mode to the rough bottom baric clinic mode, you get faster speeds because the deformation radius is larger, and so therefore the square of the deformation radius is larger. So, so yep, yep. What do you mean by rough? Is it flat bottom? Which one? What? What well, are you talking about? The rough. Yes, yes. This is the one with no flow at the bottom. The rough is, is no flow at the bottom. These are the surface modes that have no flow at the bottom. The flat are the ones that do have flow at the bottom. So, so these were calculated with a flat, the traditional flat bottom baroclinic modes. And here, what I'm doing is I'm recalculating the ratio of these speeds using the zero flow at the bottom boundary instead to calculate the deformation radius, okay? Um, so what we predict is this, is this is the error that you would predict. So this is the ratio of the rough to the flat bottom phase speeds. And what you see is that they're about twice as fast <laughs> here. It gets noisy down here, but it's about twice as fast. And then at lower latitudes, it's less. It's 1.5, 1.25. Um, the ratios that Chelton et al. got for the observed speed to the flat bottom speed are these orange things, and you can see they overlie each other, right? So with the data, data's noisy, and so we, there's a bit of bouncing up and down. But this is a very simple explanation about why the eddies are going faster than expected, because they're going faster than expected with a flat bottom ocean. Okay, they're going exactly the right speed if you have a rough bottom ocean. Okay. So this is the simplest, I think, the simplest explanation for, why, for this discrepancy, um, which generated all this interest back 20 years ago. Okay, now I'm going to change gears. Oh, good. Um, and I want to talk about what topography does to instability. Okay. Um, so instability is, yep, yep. Who said Joe? Oh, okay. Yep. Of course, of course. Yeah. Uh huh. Yeah. 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 
Uh-huh. Okay. That's right. You were one of the theoretical people that worked on this. I know. Yeah, on this problem. <laughs> yeah. 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 That's right. I remember your, yeah, I remember this paper. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. 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 Um, the point is, though, still, I mean, that the bottom is not flat, right? You know, and so, so I would say, I'm sure this is, there's, what you're saying is correct, but I would like to see what would happen if you change the bottom boundary condition, okay? If you, what would happen if you do the same calculation, but without a flat bottom, to see what would happen. Yeah. Yeah, 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 okay. Okay, anyway, we can talk about that after. Um, what I'm interested now is, is talking about, so we also were looking at what happens to stability. So now I'm thinking specifically about a jet like the, like the Gulf Stream. Uh, the Gulf Stream is, as we know, it's unstable. This is a, this is a picture from, of SST, and you have, you know, the, eddy, the Gulf Stream meanders as it comes off the coast of North America, and it forms these large eddies on both sides, and so this is uh, of interest why this happens. Um, much of our understanding about instability, um, particularly bare clinic instability, comes from flat bottom models, right? This is what we're used to. Our fundamental models of bare clinic instability typically have a flat bottom. Now, there are exceptions. So, um, and there, there were a number of studies that were done when you have this type of thing, similar to what I was looking at for the modes, when you have a bottom slope, and then you have some kind of... Uh, some kind of shear, vertical shear. Um, this one, this is like the Phillips model from 1954, when you have no horizontal shear, and you have, but you have vertical shear. Um, this was studied by a number of authors uh, looking at this effect, what the bottom slope does. Um, and then you also have a couple examples of what happens when you have this type of situation. You have a bottom slope and you have a lateral shear as well, okay? Um, I'm gonna talk about the second case here, uh, what happens when you have a lateral shear and you also have a bottom slope. And in particular, I'm going to ask what type of bottom slopes will be required to change the character of this, and will it change? I mean, will we change from baroclinic instability over to something different? Okay. So, these are the equations. Um, if you don't know what these are, these are the basically the same, these are the quasi-geostrophic equations uh, for the ocean, where we have a surface velocity in the upper layer, no no mean velocity in the lower layer. These are uh, stretching, these are the fruit numbers which are, have to do with the, the, basically the stretching due to the motion of this interface. Um, this is the mean potential vorticity gradient uh, in the two layers, uh, which has to do with the beta effect, but also the slope of these, of these uh, interfaces, the surface in the bottom, and so forth. And what we do is we just put in a, uh, a wave solution, and then we end up with something, an equation in Y, which we have to solve numerically, okay? We're gonna, eventually what I'll do is look at what happens when you put bumps in, and it gets too complicated to do this um, analytically, so we have to do this numerically, all right? So this is uh, from that, okay, and the jet is this secant squared jet. This is what's called the Bickley jet, so this is a, one that's also used in a lot of stability studies. Okay, um, so just some background. This is one of the most influential, maybe the most influential model when it comes to thinking about instability. This is the ED model from 1949. Um, Charney had a model in 1947, uh, which included beta and a number of other things, but is, is analytically much harder to do, and so it is much, much less well known. This one is fairly straightforward to do, and so most people know this one. And it gives very realistic um, structures for the atmosphere. Okay, so for the atmosphere, you tend to see things like this. So what you have, the ED model, you have this kind of structure. You have a flat bottom, you have a channel, you have a mean flow, which is a linear function of height. Uh, and when you do this calculations, it's very simple because there's no PV gradient in the middle of the interior of the domain. Everything is happening on the boundaries here. And you develop bare clinic instability because you have uh, anomalies, which are temperature anomalies in the atmosphere. So on the tropopause, and down on the surface, and they couple, uh, and there's this characteristic tilt. So this is something that's also well known in, in meteorology. You get this sort of tilt where the unstable eddies are tilting into the mean flow. So the mean flow is going this way, and these things are actively pushing against it, and they're extracting energy from the mean flow and growing. Okay, this is, again, this is something I also teach in my 
master's course about you know, what we understand about instability. Um, flat bottom again. All right, um, I'm gonna show some curves which look like this. This goes back to this paper by Blumsack and Girash. They took the ED model and then put a slope on the bottom. And interestingly, this, this paper was uh, written, the application they had in mind was Mars, okay, because they were interested in the Martian atmosphere. And in the Martian atmosphere, you have mountain ranges, okay, and so the winds were blowing over the mountains, and so they were just asking, what do the mountains do for, uh, to this instability? Uh, this paper has become very influential in coastal oceanography, right, because there you have a mean velocity which is blowing along, you have a continental slope, so it's a very similar situation. So a lot of people refer to this. But you have a curve which looks like this. This is the growth rate as a function of the slope and also as a function of the wave number, all right? So if you have no slope, that's the ED problem, that's right here, and you look through this, then what you see is you have a maximum growth rate about here, okay? So this is, this is well known, so you have some preferred value. This is about the, the value is somewhere around uh, 2,000 kilometers in the atmosphere. It's comparable to the um, size of low pressure systems in the atmosphere. Um, you, the, the, it goes down to, the, the growth rates go down to here, but the, they get cut off up here, so there's a short wave cutoff. So out here, all of these waves, these short waves are stable, and that's because the waves are so small they can't couple between the two boundaries, okay? Um, now, as you change the slope, you, what you see is an asymmetric response, okay? On this side, if you have a positive slope, so now that's a slope which is going up in this direction, so I'll call that a positive slope. Um, what you see is that initially the growth rates get slightly larger, but then they go down, and then past a certain value, you don't have any instability anymore, okay? So a slope can actually kill off instability. And again, this is something that's well known in coastal oceanography, that the jet, if you have a bottom slope, it can, it can stifle baroclinic instability. All right, but if the slope goes the other way, so it's actually shallowing to the south here, um, then it does not do that. So but what happens instead is that the most unstable wave number shifts to smaller and smaller scales. Okay, and I'll show you an example of this in a minute. So, but it's a very unusual effect. So one side of the slope does this, one's the other side of the slope does not, but you get smaller and smaller eddies. Okay, yes? Uh, no, oh yeah, yeah. Um, good question. I, that's something I thought about when I wrote this paper um, two years ago, year and a half ago. And uh, I, don't, I don't remember what the answer is, but there's, yeah, I don't, yeah, 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 yeah. No, I, it's a small effect, but it's definitely an effect. And so the maximum growth is right about there. Um, yeah, I don't remember the answer, so, but it's some, something subtle like that, yeah. Okay, all right, so here's what happens. This is the calculation that, that I'm doing using this model. Uh, I have a two-layer flow, I have Again, this is not the ED model, this is, this is a two-layer flow, this was continuously stratified. Um, but this is that same uh, curve, this growth rate curve, and you see that you get something very similar, except for that, actually. So that maximum now is shifting down over here, so, so the details shift a little bit. But basically the general character is the same, that if you have a large enough positive slope, you stabilize the flow, but if the slope is negative, then the instability shifts to smaller and smaller scales. So qualitatively, it's very similar to what we see. Now this is what happens if the jet is wide, okay? So if it's four times the deformation radius, then it is this kind of thing. So the Gulf, if the deformation radius in the Gulf Stream region is 30 to 40 kilometers, then we're talking about a jet which is 120 kilometers wide, all right. Um, if, though, you have a narrower jet, so if the width is more like twice the deformation radius, and this is the case for the Gulf Stream, then what happens is that that curve um, is narrower now, so, but it still exists, so you still see this. But on top and below, you have these wings, okay? So you have non-zero uh, growth for slopes which are outside that range, okay? So in this case, we would say we have, we have a strong enough positive slope, we have no growth at all. Here we say if we have a strong enough slope, we still have growth, okay? So something fundamentally is changing when you have a narrower, uh, narrower jet, okay? So we still, it look, the center part resembles this, but these wings are new. All right, 
And remember, this one had no lateral shear, this one has lateral shear, so that's the difference, is that we have some kind of localized jet. All right. Um, now, what baroclinic instability does, the fundamental thing about baroclinic instability is it fluxes heat, okay? It's the reason why um, that the temperature outside here today is minus one, not minus 30, okay? Because the storm systems are fluxing heat to higher latitudes. I mean, I teach up in uh, Spitsbergen uh, every year, and there the temperatures tend to hover about minus five, something like that. But they would be minus 80, okay, if it weren't for the heat fluxes that were occurring due to storm formation in the, in the, Gulf, in the jet stream. Okay, These, in a two-layer model, the heat flux is actually a thickness flux, um, so it's a, flux, it's a thickness in that layer, and what you can do is you can check the thickness fluxes, and what you find is that the thickness fluxes exist on this curve here, but not on these wing parts here. Okay, so up here, if we have a strong positive slope, we have unstable growth that has no thickness flux at all, no heat flux. All right? And so what, what is happening here is in these regions, this is lateral instability. It's sometimes called barotropic instability. I prefer lateral instability because it's not barotropic. Okay, it's only occurring in the upper layer, but it's a shear instability. Uh, so you have things that are moving things uh, sideways in the upper layer. There's no thickness flux because it's all confined to the upper layer. Here, this is, actually, this is baroclinic instability, um, and this involves a coupling between things in the surface and the, and the bottom, and that results in the thickness fluxes. Okay? So, what this says is that if you have a strong enough positive slope, you suppress baroclinic instability, you have no baroclinic instability, but you have lateral instability. Right? So you just have this with no heat flux. Okay, just to show some examples of what these things look like, um, so here's a slice, this is at, through that curve, this is at zero slope, so this is, this is our equivalent of the ED mode, um, and what you see, this is the surface eddy field, and this is the bottom eddy field. And if you look closely, what you see is that when you have a blue here, it shifted in the vertical, okay? So this is this one here, and it shifted down. So that's that tilt that I was talking about. And this is typical of baroclinic instability. And so this is what we have here. We have a bar strong baroclinic instability. That's the fastest growth is happening right there. And it's dominantly uh, a baroclinic instability. Here's two examples when you have a positive slope and a negative slope. Here's the positive slope, all right? The surface eddies look very similar to these, that you have this type of uh, tilt to it. This is consistent with flexing momentum out of the center of that jet. Um, and if, but if you look at the eddies in the lower part, they're directly aligned underneath the upper eddies. There's no tilt. Okay? And what's happening here is that these eddies in the surface are pushing the interface up and down, and they generate flow in the lower layer, but it's very weak. So here, if you look at the, this, this is about 20 times weaker in the lower layer than it is in the upper layer. All right. So the bottom slope is stifling the growth of energy in the lower layer, uh, and it's just due to this interf interfacial motion. All right. But over here, all right, now we have both. We have lateral instability and we have baroclinic instability, but the fastest growth is still right there on that baroclinic mode. And again, what you see is that these are smaller eddies, Okay, this is that because this is shifting to smaller, to higher wave numbers, but there's still a tilt going on over here. So for this strong negative slope like this, we still have active baroclinic instability. All right. So this is a weird thing. It depends on which way your current is going according to this, right? If your current is going um, in the sense of the Gulf Stream, uh, then you're in this regime, okay, over the slope, and you would expect to have suppression of baroclinic instability. But if it's going like this, which is the case of the Norwegian current, which is right off uh, our coast, it should be looking like this. So it should have active, a lot of small eddies, a lot of baroclinic instability. All right. Now, there, some people have done work of looking at instability, that ha what happens when you have bumps, okay, not slopes. The critical slope here for shutting off this instability here when you put in the numbers, the critical slope is somewhere around 1%. So we're not talking about 10 to the minus 5 anymore. We're talking about 1%, which is a pretty significant slope. Um, so, but if you have a bottom bump, okay, if you have a bottom bump which has a, a wavelength of about one kilometer, then you only need to have a height of about 100 meters or 50 meters um, to get the same slope. Okay, so for bottom bumps, you need much less uh, 
much less severe features for this to happen. Okay, there's a couple of works that, were, that looked at this. There was a paper by Benelov in 2001 using this Phillips model. That's what, basically what I'm using. Um, and then Jacques Venest wrote a paper in 2003 using um, the ED model with different slopes. And in both cases, they found suppression of baroclinic instability by bumps. Okay, so did this problem again with ridges. And so, sorry, I'm going to have to speed up a little bit here, but the ridges. And so we have some kind of cosine function in the lower layer. We make that only vary in the y direction, again, so we can use the same numerical solutions to do this. Um, and this is what happens. If you have no bottom bumps, it looks like this. You add the bottom bumps, and then what tends to happen is you, you're impacting this portion of the growth rate curve. So this is actually starting to become weaker. And if you increase the slope, the height of the bumps even more, then basically what you do is you remove the Baird clinic instability. The only thing that's left is this lateral instability uh, in the middle. And this is the portion which has no heat flux. So on the wings here, you have some heat fluxes, but in the middle, you have nothing. So basically, the bumps are inhibiting Baird clinic instability and giving you just lateral instability. Okay? Um, when you ask about how large those bumps have to be and you plug in your dimensional values, then the answer is that you need bumps about 10 meters high. Okay. In a 5,000 meter deep ocean, you need, only need bumps at the one kilometer scale, which are about 10 meters high. That's not the resolution of E-topo, right? Uh, no, that's, uh, below that's below the resolution of E-topo, exactly. So, but fortunately, okay, have friends who are marine geologists, okay? And what the geologist, so I contacted a good friend of mine uh, who works in Paris, and what they do is, like you say, it's below, below the resolution. E topo 1 is about the best. That's about 10 kilometer resolution. Point, yeah, E topo 1. Um, this is about an order of magnitude below that. But when they are doing surveys, seismic surveys uh, on these ships, they can get to much better resolution. So these are, so he picked up data from these different regions here. So in the Gulf Stream, in the Curacao, and in the Antarctic Circumpolar Current. And calculated the RMS heights for these different regions, okay? So if you look at this one on the left, that's for, this is for a 10 kilometer search region, this is for a one kilometer search region. In the ACC, the RMS heights in those regions are about 30 meters at, at the one kilometer scale. Okay, so three times larger than what we'd expect. Here, the Curcio, it's 20 to 30, that's all. It's actually the Gulf Stream which is the weakest, okay? Um, and I asked why, and it's, you know, and I, because I, I'm not a geologist, but the, um, but it's because of um, a lot of sediment. There's a lot of sediment below the Gulf Stream, so you have the spreading of these regions, and it makes it fairly flat. Okay, so the bumps are are reduced in the Gulf Stream, but in these other cases, we have significant bumps, and they're strong enough that we would say, okay, the bumps are probably suppressing uh, bear clinic instability to some extent. All right, but it made me wonder about what happens with the Gulf Stream. Okay, so I contacted. Eric Chassinet, who's an oceanographer who works in Florida, and they're running very high resolution models of the, nor of the uh, North Atlantic. Uh, yeah, it's a, primarily the North Atlantic. And this is an example. This is a snapshot of relative vorticity. Um, here's the Gulf Stream coming off, and this is this meandering I was talking about and all these eddies that are forming on either side. Okay. And I said, you know, have you looked at the vertical structure of, of these eddies uh, and of the meanders in particular? And he said, no, no, we haven't done that. And I said, would you like to? Yes, great. So started sending these fields. This is the relative vorticity at 2,000 meters. So this is about halfway down through the water column. And what I've got here is these curves. This is the sea surface height curves. So this is telling you the Gulf Stream position. And what you see here is when you look at the eddies, which are below the surface, they tend to be exactly below the meanders, okay? What you, what you tend to see is that they're exact. There's no obvious tilt that you'd expect as you would have with baroclinic instability, that they're rather they're aligned, okay? And if you take a vertical slice through this, you see this very clearly. So here's the winter vertical structure, taking a slice through the mean position of the Gulf Stream, and you look at these eddies, and they're very strongly surface intensified, and they go straight down to the bottom. So they get weaker going down the bottom, but there's no obvious tilt that's happening with that, okay? This is, um, this is the vorticity field and this is the horizontal velocities. Okay, so it's, it appears that the Gulf Stream too is also in this more aligned state. And there was a paper um, years ago, 
uh, 25 years ago or something from observations where they were examining the deep eddies underneath the Gulf Stream and the authors said it doesn't look like baroclinic instability, it looks instead like the interface is spinning up motion. Okay, so the interface is moving up and down and it's driving motion below, below the surface, which is exactly consistent with what we're saying here. Okay, so um, just in summary, so when you ha even when you have weak bottom slopes, the baroclinic modes shift from traditional modes to surface modes. Okay, um, the, surf the bar traditional baroclinic modes only apply when you have really, really weak bottom slopes, ten less than 10 to the minus 7. So for realistic bottom topography, it's this alternate set of modes which applies. Um, surface modes have a larger deformation radius, typically 25 to 50 percent larger. And that means that they should propagate faster. They're covering a larger area, so they're more sensitive to the beta effect, and they move faster than they would otherwise. You need strong bottom slopes to suppress baroclinic instability in the ocean, um, and that favors lateral instability at the surface, but you can get the same effect from very modest bottom bumps, okay, 10 meter bumps or something. So that tends to have the same effect. Um, and high resolution simulation suggests that you have these eddies which are at depth, which are aligned with the eddies that are at the surface. Okay. Now, uh, one thing that I haven't talked about is what happened to the barotropic mode. Okay, um, the barotropic mode is it's such a central thing in oceanography that a lot of times we look at depth integrated velocities. Okay, that we we take observations and we depth integrate them and we say that's what the barotropic mode is doing. Blah blah blah. Okay, the barotropic mode vanishes when you have there really is no barotropic mode. Um, but what, is, what it's replaced by are topographic waves. So this is what Reins wrote about in that 1970 paper. These, these uh, modes, these waves, which are trapped down at the bottom. So their vertical height depends on the stratification. So if they're very small, they're trapped at the bottom. If they're very large, then they can extend all the way through the water column. But they're distinct from the barotropic mode because they're locked to topography. Um, I always think that top, the topographic waves or topographic mode is one of the least respected uh, dynamics in the ocean. People don't think about it very often, but I think that the ocean is probably full of it. I mean, I think it's an extremely important thing that hasn't been really considered very much. Um, we've also done some calculations um, for Rossby waves over bumps. There was a wonderful paper by Bobrovich and Resnick in 1999 uh, where they looked at this, at this issue too. And what we're finding there also is that these baroclinic modes are switched off if you have bumps about 10 meters. So you only need to have small bumps and then you, you switch off um, the deep flow. So, and also I just, I think that, you know, so many, I mean, uh, you showed, somebody showed that, that picture of the, of the, um, the ch from the Chessy article about the anarch circumpolar current, how that connects. All of those models that, you know, and you have this, this sort of shoebox model have flat bottom. Okay, and that means that those, those flat bottoms models are, have incorrect vertical structures, and that can give fundamentally different answers. So we have to really rethink what type of bottom boundary condition we're using in our models. I mean, probably a better thing if you're running a model is just to make it rough, you know, just put in bumps. Okay, that's it. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> Long wave approximation. Yeah. Uh huh. Uh, yeah. Well, well, it's it's. I mean, officially. Yeah. 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 That's true. That's true. But the usual argument is that it's it's the long wave approximation, so that the wave scale is much larger than the deformation radius, right? So in that limit, that's what you that's what you get is you get the beta LD squared, but it's, so just, it, it's okay. So and L are going, essentially becoming small compared to, to one over LD. Yeah. 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 
Ja. So the equation yeah. that has yeah. a YP and yeah. coefficient. But you probably still can have a long wave approximation in that case too, though, can't you? I mean, you can have a case where the, where the wave scale is much larger than the deformation radius. You, you can still look at that limit. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. But there's still, it still is the case, though, right, that even using this, I mean, admittedly, overly simple, it's a beta plane approximation, so it's all of those things. I mean, you get fairly close, even with a flat bottom, to the observed propagation speeds. And when you put in the rough bottom, you're basically right on that curve. So there is a very similar you know, relationship. No, I'm, but, I'm yeah, that, yeah. I'm sure that yours removes part of the uh, error. Right. The other thing I want to say is that in those early works, uh, Sheldon and Schwartz used the Wayland transform, yeah. which became like the main tool for analyzing yeah. those uh, right. specific yeah. of variation. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, later on, I think Carl Wunsch used them also yep. to the SFT. There are other variables. That's right. That's right. The same method. Recently, I published a paper. Uh, somehow, I uh, found it to be unsatisfactory when there are so many papers and all of them use such large errors. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. And I decided to test those methods mm -hmm. that are being used for interpreting the, the satellite observation mm -hmm. by taking modes that I know the amplitude and phase specific, mm -hmm. sealed mode, mm -hmm. and you take one mode with higher amplitude, and you know the space speed. Mm -hmm. Now there's both gradient transform and 3D SFT, and there are other two variants of mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. And they were unable to detect the dominant mode, dominant input mode, mm -hmm. unless the amplitude was about 10 times larger. Mm -hmm. okay. So yeah. in terms of our oceanographic application, hmm. interesting. Somehow, somehow yeah, yeah, interesting. It's yeah. working. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Well, I told you already that uh, in a different session, Pedro, Pedro Rica, already discussed the strategic motion, strategic motion with respect to the tech current motion. That current is about the bottom description and about right. the tech. Right. So it's that exactly. Yeah. Exactly. And yeah. Pedro said that we have not included the effect of the current motion. That's right. That's right. These so these are these are modes with no mean flow. Uh, yeah, and I you know uh, I remember when I first uh, had this paper and I sent it to Joe Pedlowski, and just just for because I was going to give a talk at Woods Hole and I said you know I thought maybe you'd be interested in this and he said and and he wrote back and he he read the paper. I mean this is Joe if you know Joe he read the paper in about 12 minutes I think. And then he immediately comes back and he says, yeah, okay, very interesting, but what happens with the mean flow, right? Because the mean flow is the main thing. The problem is when you start doing baroclinic modes with the mean flow, then you're talking about instability, right? Because you, whenever you have modes with the mean flow, you're going to have some kind of instability. Okay. Depending on what he did for the bottom. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay, okay. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. I see. Okay. Yeah. Okay. So, yeah. You also have, I mean, another thing too is so some, some of us studied this, I told you about this surface quasi geostrophic approximation. What the, the SQG modes are dynamically identical to this too, to topographic waves, except they happen at the surface. So, you can flip this upside down if you have some kind of uh, temperature gradient or something at the surface, that'll give you modes which are trapped at the surface, which are like topographic waves except upside down. So that's, that's certainly true. Yeah, and that's, when I've done these modal calculations, I just set the surface gradient equal to zero. So that's why we don't have them, but, but yeah. Yeah. I have a question. Yeah. The very last point of your conclusion. Okay. Yes. Oh, simplest no-slip condition, yeah. Um, yeah, that's an interesting point. Uh, that's, a, that's an interesting point. What, well, yeah, it, it can be very different because what, what you tend to happen when the no-slip boundary condition is you get a boundary layer at the bottom. 
right? So you have something like a Neckman layer down at the bottom. And that means that the velocity itself, the velocity structure can come down to something which is significantly different than zero and then rapidly goes to zero in that bottom boundary layer. What happens in these cases is that the modes gradually go to zero over the whole depth of the water column. So smoothly, yeah. So there's, there's a much uh, different. So, but you're, I mean, very, it, it's, uh, yeah, you're exactly right. Because there's another paper that was written after I put out that paper in 2017. There was a paper that was written by Brink and Pedlowski where they asked the question, can you get the same answer uh, that I'm seeing with a flat bottom ocean with very large bottom friction? Okay, so if you have some kind of Ekman damping. And the answer is yes, but the bottom friction that you need is enormous to be able to, to do this. So you really need a lot of friction to do that. Um, you don't need much topography. So topography is more effective at shutting off the deep flow than, than friction. Yeah, good question. Thank you. Yeah. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. That's a, uh, uh, yeah. Yeah. I'm completely on board with that. I completely agree. Yeah. That that would be yeah, just fine. Yeah. I think much clearer. I agree. The barotropic is very confusing. That's right. So, yeah. So, okay, there's a related question that David Marshall asked me one time, and he said, Joe, do you believe in the one and a half layer model now? Okay. The one and a half layer model is the simplest version that captures this. So, that's what you have. You had a two and a half layer model, right? Because you have two active layers plus a deep lower layer. Right. That's right. So, an even simpler one is one active, right, with that. And what would you get in the one and a half layer? You can get horizontal shear instability, right, because you have an active upper layer, but you have no transfer in the vertical. So, the one and a half layer model is really the simplest model that, that represents this, too. It, there are still, we've been looking at things like two dimensional bumps, and there are still vertical transfers of energy which, which happen. If you're pushing the interface up and down, you still spinning up the lower layer, and you can still dissipate energy. So there's, you're, you're, you'd lose that in the one and a half layer model. But as far as like this sort of stuff goes, it's exactly the same. I mean, it, it hasn't, it, it, the one and a half layer model captures that exactly. So yeah, so I agree. Okay, okay, so, so, <laughs> okay. All right, so one I got to flip upside down, the other one I got to rotate by 90 degrees. Okay, okay, good. I'll, I'll see if I remember that. <laughs> okay, all right, good. <laughs>